Another time we were really having trouble scoring and decided to take drastic measures. Usually when we split up it would be for a matter of a few minutes to cover a given area and then we'd meet back up and move somewhere else. This time though we split up for real, each armed with a hundred pesos and plans to meet back at the hotel in an hour. Despite having been unable to get anywhere for the last two hours, each one of us somehow scored individually during our hour-long search. This means we each arrived back at the hotel with an ounce of bud. There was only one thing to do. Rage. We spent the rest of the day and night rolling all of it up into joints, starting smoking as soon as the first joints were ready. We must have rolled a hundred, some of them using two or even four papers. We also bought a couple bottles of Bacardi to make the party complete, and things got so out of hand that we ended up getting thrown out of the hotel the next morning. Apparently my shit-ass brilliant brother had gotten so fucked up that he had left the room in the middle of the night, gone down a flight of stairs into the lobby, and pissed into a potted plant. Tom thought the hotel manager had mistaken him for someone else, and Eddie almost got in a fight with the manager when he found out we were getting tossed. I calmed him down though and told him Tom was most likely guilty. You see, he had a history of these phantom pissings. One time he had gone on a college visit where he had been put up in a fraternity house. As is the custom on such occasions, he got trashed and woke up the next morning to the news that he had come downstairs in the middle of the night and pissed on the coffee table in front of two of the brothers. Another time he had gotten out of bed at his girlfriend's house after a night of heavy drinking and walked past not one but two bathrooms and then peed in the hallway. Who knows how many other phantom pissings might have gone undetected. For all his academic achievement and professional ambition, my brother could still rage. We had planned to spend the rest of the day in the hotel room, just hotboxing the shit out of it before we had to get on a bus late in the afternoon. We would have had to smoke at the university pace, which is an expression that comes from my time in college. I had a friend who was from a very small town in Iowa, where apparently life moved very slow. He was wowed by the big city that was the college town of Iowa City and referred to how everything moved so much faster here, how everything moved at the university pace. I thought this was hilarious and adopted this as an expression for any time something had to be done quickly, especially smoking. Smoking at the university pace usually meant not even bothering to break the weed up. We'd just stuff a nug in the bowl and then torch the shit out of it once, then pass it back and forth quick enough that it stayed lit. You'd hold your head in until the bowl came back to you, then exhale it and immediately take another. Just straight successive blast to the dome. We could decide to get high and be fucked up 30 seconds later. This took a lot of the pleasure out of smoking, so it wasn't something that we did on a regular basis, but sometimes necessity dictated. If we wanted to catch a movie that was about to start and needed to sneak in a quick bowl beforehand, university pace. Late for class, university pace. You get the idea. It so happened that the guy that coined this term later ended up losing his mind to schizophrenia. Don't know if the university pace had anything to do with that, but I don't suppose it could have helped. Now we'd been kicked out of our hotel and had nowhere to smoke. I don't know if we were still fucked up from the night before and so had lost all judgment, but for some reason we had grown absolutely attached to our bag of joints and were determined that they would not go to waste. What to do? There was a bit of a breeze that day, so we decided we would risk smoking the joints outside, counting on the wind to disperse the smoke and make it hard to pinpoint its origin. We'd find an alley in each madly puff a joint, then move on in case someone had spotted us without our realizing it. As time ran out, we eventually resorted to just smoking on the move, keeping our eyes open for cops and hoping that the fact that we were leaving town soon would be our saving grace. I can tell you, this plan was idiotic. The smell of weed is unmistakable to anyone who knows it, and judging from the looks we were getting as we hustled through the streets, we weren't fooling anyone. We got quite a few disapproving glares from old ladies and sly grins from young men. Several times we saw cops up ahead and turned a quick corner. We each kept the joint lit, chain smoking them, and were constantly puffing. Still with a half hour to go before our bus left, we still had about 40 joints remaining. As our lungs weakened and our brains floated, we realized we were not going to make it especially since we still had to make our way to the bus station. Sure, we had been there yesterday, but when you're about 60 joints deep into a university pace bender, yesterday seems a long way away. So we had 40 joints to dispose of and we refused to put them in the trash. First we tried giving them away, just approaching young people and offering the joints up. There were no takers. I'm sure we seemed a bit sketchy, four Americans deep in the heart of Mexico practically bleeding from the eyes, stumbling along trying to give out weed like so much Halloween candy. 
In the end, we settled on a different plan. We decided to stash the joints like Easter eggs across the city, setting them on ledges and in gutters, on windowsills and in mailboxes, until they were gone. We figured that at least a few of them might be found by someone who would take advantage. We might even make some poor fucker stay. We ended up arriving at the bus station to catch our bus with just a couple minutes to spare, only to discover it was broken down and we had four more hours to kill. Tom was basically smoked out, but as I said before, Eddie and Billy are madmen, and I wasn't one to shy away from a ganja adventure, so we set off in search of some of our stashed joints. Of course we had been and were still stoned out of our minds, so our memories were not exactly on point. As such, we couldn't remember very well where any particular joint had been stashed, so we just had to scour the city, retracing our steps. Every once in a while somebody would find one and we'd light it up and continue our quest. When we finally boarded the bus, we were all faded beyond belief. We crashed into our seats and slept all the way to our next destination. So that had been our bus adventure. Hitchhiking to this beach would be something new. As it played out, there was lots of standing on the side of the road, trying to conserve our water, sweating our balls off, waiting at certain places which were good for getting picked up, eventually loading into the back of a pickup truck with a bunch of working men or fellow travelers, bouncing along as my brother jabbered away in Spanish, yelling to be heard over the sound of the air rushing by. I thought we were going to be hitchhiking with Alejandra, but our group had hit the road early for some reason, so I didn't have the pleasure of her company. Instead, it was just Tom and me and two Mexican friends, one of whom knew the way to the beach and was an experienced hitchhiker. Talking was difficult, though, so mostly we just sat there in silence anyway. We shared a ride with a few chickens. There was one guy hitchhiking with a goat, but we never caught a ride with him. Tom was popular with most everyone we met on our hitchhiking venture south. Being a gringo in central Mexico was novelty enough, and being a hitchhiking gringo only compounded that. A couple different times a small bottle was produced and passed among a few imbibers. Tom was always included and respectfully took a nap. I sat there like the idiot sidekick, uncomfortable and overheated. My ass was sore by the time we climbed out of our last truck at the Manzanillo bus station. From there we took a local bus for about 25 cents that took us to a smaller village where we made our way to a house that had a few donkeys tied up outside. We negotiated with the owner and for a few bucks succeeded in hiring him to take us to the beach. He charged extra for Tom and me because we were a bit bigger than the average Mexican, but it was only a buck more, so we didn't complain. Those donkeys really earned their pay, though. My feet were not far from dragging on the ground while I was in the saddle. We traveled about four hours on the donkeys, which got old pretty quickly. By this point, I just wanted to be there, wanted to see Alejandra, wanted to get high. What I beheld when I arrived pushed every sweaty mile into the distant past, as the present became a beacon bright enough to consume us as its fuel. Down on the beach, with the sky glowing red behind them, Alejandra and two friends were fire dancing, the balls of light spinning around them as they spun around the fire, hips like ocean waves, pushing out and pulling in. Fire dancing involved having two balls, each attached to about two feet of rope, which were held one in each hand and spun around the body like a sort of rhythmic ninja weapon. The fire came in when the balls were dipped in fuel and lit on fire, creating a dazzling spectacle. These two balls of fire spinning around Alejandra's infinite curves were mesmerizing. She looked like a fire goddess, gazing out across the ocean, deciding whether to boil it all away for fun. Or if she wasn't a goddess, she was some sort of elemental fairy, channeling the powers of the center of the blazing earth, the molten core coming to life in effigy then whipped around her body and head, spun as smooth as if she was born for this very purpose on this very night. A few people were playing drums and the three women were dancing to the rhythm, their hips moving in a sort of salsa pattern, the globes of fire spinning in rhythm with everything. She reminded me of a lyric I had that went, When she dances she becomes water in the wind, turning the music into gold. With fire in her spine and thunder in her hips she is Armageddon's wonder to behold. This was world-ending beauty. This was elemental power. Fire and thunder, not to mention lightning, wind, and rain, all taken human form and plugged into the rhythm of the circle drum. 